We're going to get started. I want to say thank you for joining us. Um, we are a small group today, but I know a lot of folks are also going to watch the recording later. Um, I am delighted as we gather to learn about affordable housing, to learn about the story of one community um, and what is happening in Eau Claire and how those around the state can learn from it. My name is Reverend Brianna Elane, and I am the Director of Ecumenical Innovation and Justice Initiatives at the Wisconsin Council of Churches. Um, this is kind of a kickoff to of an online um, webinar that will lead into an in-person event in Appleton. And so I'm going to hand it over to Steve to talk a little bit about that. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Steve Herbie, and I'm a member of the planning committee for the Faith Communities Housing Summit that will be held in Appleton on October 12th. And I want to thank our presenters, uh, Susan and Paul, first for their hard work and effective work in addressing housing challenges in the Eau Claire area. And then um, especially today for their being willing to tell us all about it. And thanks as well to the Wisconsin Council of Churches, uh, especially Reverend Brianna for uh, collaborating with us in Appleton and assisting us in planning and shaping the summit. And then thanks to all of you who've gathered here online today to participate. And, to those who will be watching the recording afterwards. Let me explain that while this webinar is offered in support of the upcoming housing summit, participation in the webinar is not restricted to summit attendees. Everyone's welcome to watch, listen, ask questions, so forth. And we hope everyone finds inspiration, information, and motivation in what is shared today. Uh, our reason for connecting the webinar to the housing summit is related to the overall goal of the summit, which is to inspire and equip faith communities in the Fox cities to engage in collective action around housing. And with that goal in mind, rather than taking time in the summit itself to bring everyone up to speed, so to speak, we're offering the webinar and sharing a list of readings so that summit participants can prepare themselves beforehand. We hope this approach will allow more time during the summit itself to learn about specific kinds of change that faith communities working together can focus on. Thank you for being here. And I think we're ready to roll. Great, we will pass it over to Susan and Paul. And just for those attending, um, as we go along, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A and there'll be a time at the end where we'll um, lift those up and kind of have a discussion with all of us. So thank you, Susan and Paul. So are you going to go to our first slide, Brianna? Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much to Reverend Brianna and the Wisconsin Council of Churches for inviting us. Uh, we certainly look forward to your questions at the end, we are going to be talking about one community's experience with housing advocacy in our community of Eau Claire. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Hello, my name is Paul Savides. I'm a longtime member of Jonah and uh, also co-chair of the Affordable Housing Task Force and co-director of the Eau Claire Tent Landlord Resource Center. I'm gonna tell you uh, the story of how our task force got started. Um, but before I do that, I, I need to give you a little background into our organization called Jonah. Those of you in Appleton have an organization similar called Esther, so you're probably familiar with how congregation-based organizing goes on. Well, Jonah started, um, oh, by the way, Jonah stands for Joining Our Neighbors Advancing Hope. We were founded in 2007 by seven local congregations. And since 2007, uh, we have grown to include 18 local congregations and uh, many individual members from non-member congregations, non-faith-based communities, and from other organizations. We also have working partnerships with several local agencies, organizations, and nonprofits. Jonah is a local interfaith grassroots organization that seeks to build partnerships and coalitions among um, the affected community and local stakeholders. 
We hope to bring about long-term systemic and cultural change for those who are most vulnerable and need and in need in our communities. Um, a key belief and practice in Jonah is that those who are most affected by the problem are best able to know the solutions. So we build relationships with those in the affected community and work together to find and implement solutions. Jonah is one of 12 affiliate organizations around the state of Wisconsin. All of us are members of the parent organization, Wisdom, who has its offices in Milwaukee. And it's through Wisdom that we've received training. We connect with our sister affiliates, such as Esther, and we work together on statewide issues and actions. Most of the work that Jonah does in, in Eau Claire is through its task forces. And task forces are formed in response to local issues of importance to Jonah members and the community at large. Currently, there are Jonah task forces around seven issues, affordable housing, child poverty, criminal justice, the environment, immigration, mental health, and transportation. So where did the Affordable Housing Task Force come from? Well, we were formed in 2018 in response to our community's affordable housing crisis. Uh, in Eau Claire, we have a tradition that was started by our public library in the city of Eau Claire called the Community Read. And in 2017, the Community Read was the book Evicted. Our church and many people in the, in the community read that book and it was really a wake up call for us um, to take action. So uh, after reading Evicted and hearing from many of our congregation members, our Jonah leadership team at First Congo decided to hold a community forum on housing issues in Eau Claire. We invited representatives uh, of the, uh, from the Eau Claire Housing Authority, the Chippewa Valley Free Clinic, the Community Table, Western Dairyland, our local CAP agency, the Continuum of Care, City and County Health Department, and others to share what they knew about the housing crisis in Eau Claire. Um, there were about 40 people that attended that first forum, and they were very easy to learn more, so we held a second forum. 60 people attended that forum. We invited same, some of the same folks back again, and they had continued our conversation, and there was still more interest in learning more and talking more, so we heard a third, held a third forum, and 80 people showed up at that forum. And at the end of the forum, uh, after we talked about the problem and some potential solutions, uh, I made a call uh, to action and asked who would volunteer to step forward and, and uh, work on this issue and form a task force. 16 people stepped forward, including Susan Wolfgram, was, who was there, and Susan and uh, Judy Mosley, another resident of Eau Claire, agreed to sign on as uh, co-chairs. So since our start in 2018, the Affordable Housing Task Force has been working with community stakeholders to increase access to safe, decent, affordable housing for all our neighbors, and especially for those who have high barriers to finding housing, such as those with limited income, those with eviction or conviction histories, and those who struggle with addiction and mental health problems. So almost immediately after our task force was organized, we began to receive calls and emails from tenants who didn't understand the terms of their lease. And uh, some were in danger of eviction or were just struggling to find adequate housing. It was very apparent to us that many of our neighbors were in need of help in finding and keeping their housing. In 2019, our task force held a two-hour event at a local restaurant in town where we invited landlords and property managers to share their stories and concerns uh, around housing to those with high barriers. Uh, as a task force, we wanted to know what we and the community could do to work with tenants and landlords so that those who were struggling to find housing could do so and those that who might might be in danger of eviction 
could stay in their housing. The number one request we heard from those landlords was to have someone to call for early intervention when problems with tenants first came up. I think it was after that event that the idea of the Tenant Landlord Resource Center was born. In early 2020, core members of the Affordable Housing Task Force traveled to Madison, uh, where we met with uh, staff at the Tenant Resource Center there. And we wanted to learn how they are organized to assist tenants in Dane County. With that information and more careful research, consultations with local housing stakeholders, we came up with a business plan. We applied for grants from the Eau Claire Community Foundation and the Pablo Foundation, and we started up the Eau Claire Tenant Landmark Research Center. In 2021, we received a grant from Eau Claire County through the American Rescue Plan Act to continue our work, and we hired our first project coordinator. So that's the origin of the Affordable Housing Task Force and the Eau Claire Tenant Landlord Resource Center. And you'll hear more about both of those from Susan later on. Next slide, please. So Susan and I are currently the co-chairs. We're both volunteers. We put in a lot of hours each day. And uh, without the support and encouragement of each other, I don't think we'd stay in the work, but uh, it's work that we love and uh, we're, uh, we're glad to work together. Next slide. Our mission, uh, as it says here, is to facilitate culture change in Eau Claire City and County so that all stakeholders are informed about the lack of safe, good quality, affordable housing and are motivated to take actions to address it through public and private initiatives. I want to call your attention to a couple of things in that statement. First of all, uh, we're working toward culture change. We feel that that is the most long lasting change that occur, that will occur in a community. If we can change the culture and the dominant narrative, we can make uh, solutions occur. Susan will share some good examples of, of some successful culture change that we've done in the community already. Secondly, um, public and private initiatives and partnerships are absolutely necessary to make the kind of impact we need to make uh, with uh, providing affordable housing. Uh, it's, it's a huge problem and it's a public problem and we need all hands on deck to solve that. Next slide, please. So it's all about relationships. Um, those of you who are involved in, with Esther know that um, the success of any community organizing effort depends on developing relationships. That is absolutely the lifeblood of our organization. To the degree that Jonah is successful, it's because of the relationships we've developed over the years with those in the affected community and with other community stakeholders and partners. Uh, one of my roles in Jonah is to conduct leadership training events. And our most requested and effective training, I believe, is, is called Building Relationships Through One-to-One -one Conversations. So in that training, we teach the skill of listening, uh, listening without interruption, without judgment, and with courage and curiosity to people that we'd like to get to know. We want to hear their stories. We want to start a relationship. This is a skill that can be practiced and perfected. Through one-to-ones, we learn a person's self-interest. That is what they are passionate about, what motivates them to act, what do they really care about and what will they do something about? That's their self-interest. By intentionally holding one-to-one -one conversations, we systematically identify key stakeholders in the community and initiate and build relationships to identify our mutual self-interests. It's by developing these relationships then that we are able to build partnerships and coalitions to get things done. 
Each group that you see on the list there indicates scores of one-to-ones that Susan and I have done to develop successful working relationships. Each one of those groups is an integral partner in, in solving the problems that we're working on in our community. Next slide, uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Paul. That was a very meaningful context moving forward. So collaboration, as you have already guessed, is at our core. We particularly advocate for impacted persons to be seated at the tables where decisions are being made around housing, and sometimes you simply have to build new tables. Next slide. We were a founding uh, partner with our regional Chippewa Valley Affordable Housing Task Force, and this is a community housing stakeholder group. And one of the primary things that came out of this to guide our region in terms of affordable housing was 42 stakeholder recommendations to city council to guide our work and then our task force advocated for a top priority of this group to be a housing opportunities commission at city council. And that was eventually then institutionalized in 2021. Next slide. So we all know that we have a national affordable housing crisis. And again, these groups of folks, the most vulnerable, lowest income seniors, people with disabilities, families with children, low wage workers um, are having a much more difficult time, often paying up to 50% of their income on rent. And we really don't have a way to build for them. And the highest, the highest barrier folks are those with eviction histories and those with justice impacted histories. Um, we shy away from saying criminal histories now because that tends to be extremely stigmatizing. I also want to mention that Eau Claire has a very low vacancy rate. I believe currently it's at or below 3% when a more healthy vacancy rate generally hovers around 6%. When you have a low vacancy rate, then that means that landlords really have no incentive to be able to reach out to those who really need the help and they're also less likely to take vouchers. Next slide. I think it is important um, to just go over this quickly because we're often asked, well, what really is the definition of affordable housing? So to have common language, I just wanted to review this that we generally go by the HUD definition, so that is your housing expenses, including utilities that are less than or equal to 30% of your gross household income. I've always found it interesting that it wouldn't be 30% or, or less of your uh, take home pay, but anyway, that's the HUD definition. And then it's calculated within the context of the area median income, which, um, is similar to the county median income. Sometimes you'll see those interchanged. And right now that area median income hovers close to $70,000 in, in Eau Claire. So for us on our task force, when we talk about affordable housing, it's on a spectrum from those that are unhoused to professionals and middle-class families not able to afford a home of their own. Workforce housing is considered quote unquote affordable. And in Eau Claire, that's the category that we have been building for. And so I think we've built probably over a thousand units of workforce housing uh, within, within the last few years. And that's targeted towards those earning 80 to 100% of the area me median income. But in Eau Claire, and if you look at your um, local ALICE reports, you'll be able to get your calculations. In Eau Claire, almost 40% of our low-income community members earning 35,000 and less per year are also part of our workforce. 
but we don't acknowledge them when it comes to building quote unquote workforce housing. And in everyone we talk to, whether we're talking with developers or funders, you'll find that nearly everyone knows someone in their family or friends who is housing insecure. Next slide. If you haven't read the book Evicted or Matthew Desmond's new book called Poverty, um, excuse me, called Poverty by America, we highly recommend that you read these two books. They are really game changers and they were game changers in our community. And Matthew starkly reminds us that yes, in spite of childcare costs, healthcare costs, and transportation costs, that it's the rent that eats first. Next slide. I, I wanted to touch on the difference between gentrification and revitalization. Gentrification is when a community really is only in, interested in increased property valuation and business growth without any intentional plan, and that's the word, an intentional plan to sustain their affordable housing in their area. If you do not have an intentional plan to do that, then what we see is displacement of residents. And often you never know where these folks go. It seems like they just disappear in a neighborhood. Revitalization is what we advocate for. So it focuses on the culture of the neighborhood, maintaining the culture, the preservation of the neighborhood. It includes a diversification of incomes within the same neighborhood and focuses on not displacing residents. So it's a both and. It's growth with affordability. And we're doing this in a number of our districts in Eau Claire, particularly right now, the Cannery District, which is really the up and coming district. We continue to monitor the development in that area. And we may have to have future ordinances that prevent investment companies from really coming into an area and actually buying up complete blocks of older homes in the neighborhood, raising rents, and then displacing people. So this would be an example of gentrification. And the power of neighborhood associations, which we highly recommend that you advocate for if you do not have any or just a few neighborhood associations, is they empower the neighborhoods to be the gatekeepers. And so, at the plan commission, for instance, that I sit on, we very much privilege the uh, perspective of the neighborhood association when a new development comes forward. And I, for instance, I'm not the only one, but I, for instance, will ask a developer that comes forward if they have already consulted with the neighborhood association about that development, if it's a good fit for the neighborhood. And if they haven't, then I'll recommend that they come back after they have done so. Next slide. So I'm just going to highlight a couple um, of things here. I already talked about the low vacancy rate. Eau Claire has been in approximately a 10 year gentrification process starting with our confluence project, but much more conscious now and culturally changing towards re revitalization. One of our game changers too, and this is the importance of having relationships with journalists in your area to really raise awareness of your community, a wake up call for your community in terms of the crisis of the lack of affordable housing is our relationship with Julian Emerson. And on September 8th, 2018, he wrote a piece called A Tale of Two Eau Claire's, published in the Leader Telegram, which really woke up our community to how almost half of the community members were struggling to pay their rent. 
And also, on, um, also in early September, we had the first, the first, um, excuse me, it was, yes, it was September 24th, 2018. We advocated for the first Monday public hearing at city council. Since then, the Monday public hearings have been institutionalized, but this one we organized to focus purely on affordable housing. And the chamber was packed with housing insecure folks sharing their stories, most of whom have never spoken publicly, many of whom asked for one of us to come up with them to be able to give them confidence enough to speak to their city council members. And, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher um, and I think, you know, evidence-based um, data is very, very, very important. But honestly, if you don't share the stories, it's very difficult to move the people that are making the decisions. So I would get council members messaging me during, during the meeting, in spite of all the data that we provided, they said to me that it was that person's story that made them move forward supporting efforts on affordable housing. And then of course, I, I'm sure all of you or most of you are familiar with your United Way Alice report. And if you're not, I would, um, I would advise you to go ahead and be familiar with that. And I've already talked about how in Eau Claire County, 36% of our neighbors are income insecure and many are paying 50% of their income on rent. Next slide. So currently in Eau Claire, we have 12% of our households that are in poverty. Um, and I think a point to really make for a lot of your community members or local government officials or your city council who really aren't that concerned from let's say a moral or ethical basis about affordable housing is to make the economic development argument that housing for our workforce, including our low income workers is economic development and it's good for business. Because yes, a home is where a job goes to sleep at night. And then um, also in 2019, we organized the public to show up again to prioritize affordable housing in our capital improvement project plan, which never had a category for affordable housing. But again, that impacted experience, those stories that were shared influenced the city council to include $700,000 to start in 2020 for single family and multifamily affordable housing. The very first time that housing was included in the capital improvement project budget. So just because someone says it's never happened before does not mean it cannot happen. And I have to give our city council and city staff a lot of credit for bold, boldly, many times boldly supporting creative efforts to make affordable housing a top priority in Eau Claire. Next slide. So the two, the two initiatives that we have spent a lot of time on the first one is to have a day resource center for primarily our chronically homeless in our community, which is increasing dramatically every year. And your point in time count indicates that in your community as well. And so for the last three years, we've had a community stakeholder group working just about every day, moving this forward to have a day resource center become a reality and just recently now, um, it is going to become a reality. We've had Western Dairyland step forward to own the building, Hope Gospel Mission, uh, to operate the actual day resource center in, in a secular way, the first time that they're going to be doing a secular 
project and the city put up a half a million dollars towards the building. And now we've just had a feasibility study concluded where the community is going to support um, a $5 million philanthropic effort. So that's going to get underway. And we hope then that we will have an operating day resource center um, by 2026. And this is going to include a spectrum of community services, a one-stop shop, and of course, permanent supportive housing is the ultimate goal. In 2021, then, we created the Eau Claire Tenant Landlord Resource Center, and we uh, just received our 501c3 designation a few months ago. And our primary mission is early intervention between tenants and landlords before the word eviction is even thought of. And one thing that we do, and I'll touch on that in just a minute, one thing that we do is we provide one-to-one -one support. So we will meet with folks one-to-one one, one -one, and we get back to folks within 24 to 48 hours. We also collaborate with our local legislators. Jody Emerson is really our champion at the state level for advocating for housing policies. Next slide. I'm going to go a little bit quickly here so that we also have time for questions. It's just really important to us that housing advocates sit at as many of the tables as possible where housing justice decisions are being made and do not wait to be invited. Use your privilege for, for the good. So these are some places where we take a seat and we also advocate for impacted community members also to have a seat at the table. And if that is not being welcomed, then we work at building a new table. So we advocate regularly. We make public comment regularly at city council meetings. I sit on the city plan commission. Um, Judy had been sitting as chair of the city housing opportunities commission. I sit on the zoning update committee, um, the city housing study committee. Uh, Paul sits on the Dairyland housing committee as well as other committees. And the point is, is just to get as many advocates of affordable housing to sit as many at as many tables as possible. Next slide. So I just want to again try to touch on some examples of our collaborative work. And we always say in Jonah that we are better together. Next slide. The Solar Circle collaboration is a very, from my perspective, a very unique collaboration and one that I would be, one I would hope would be duplicated across across our state and you can you can google solar circle and you will uh, find um, an article that will explain how it all happened but just quickly this was the city of altoona's approach to ensuring affordable housing to, to chippewa valley residents and it was really radical in its simplicity so the city had some money it bought a building it remodeled it with the help of donors and nonprofits, and now it rents units at below market rates, no tax credits, no subsidized rents, no screening of applicants to ensure their incomes are low enough to make them eligible. The rents are affordable from $400 to $700 a month from studios to two bedrooms. What our task force did was that we canvassed the neighborhood residences and businesses. We invited the neighborhood to an open house where we encouraged all questions. We embraced the controversy instead of what is typically done, which is trying to avoid the controversy, avoid the public. And then we advocated in front of the city of Altoona, city council and plan commissions. And we also sit on the Solus Circle board of directors. Next slide. Maria Guzman was Solus Circle's first tenant. She signed her lease on September 27th of 2019. 
and Maria became an organizer and an advocate. Next slide. Another example of mobilizing and um, empowering very vulnerable community members um, to be organizers and advocates themselves was the Maples Mobile Home Park community, which was really an uninhabitable um, mobile home park. And so we convened the residents, um, the city government, uh, the, the health department, our local government officials, and had them really listen to the residents about what they were living with all of them having such high rental barriers that they could not afford to live anywhere else because if they did, they most certainly would not have lived there. And this led to a number of new city ordinances regarding um, inspections and the owners of these parks that were exploiting the residents. And we also spent a lot of time finding alternatives to displacement for these current residents. Next slide. So the point I want to make here, um, as you just take a look at this slide, is that the Cannery Trail Apartments are a WIDA project. And WIDA, as I would guess you, you know, um, stands for Wisconsin, excuse me, Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority. It's a tax credit project for developers. And very often community members believe that, you know, that all our low income housing needs are being met by WIDA projects. So I just wanted to remind everyone that rural communities, and for instance, Eau Claire is still considered a rural community, we very rarely are granted these projects. So it, in Eau Claire, we're lucky if we get one perhaps every two years. And when we get them, they only afford maybe 30 to 60 units to meet the need of those folks that are earning 60% or less of the area or the county median income. And to put that in perspective, right now in Eau Claire, we have over 400 folks that are waiting on our housing authority, our city housing authority waiting list. We have nearly that number waiting on our county list. So this is only a quote unquote drop in the bucket in terms of what we need. Yes, do we need them? Absolutely. But we cannot rely on WIDA projects. Next slide. Prairie Heights is also a WIDA project. What is interesting as you, as you read through, through that is that the WIDA projects, they also need gap funding in order to make them a reality. Very, very, very expensive to build, to be able to meet, to meet this need. And so we will advocate for the developer in front of city council for gap funding. And the gap funding generally now in Eau Claire, if it is approved, will come from the affordable housing fund that emerged out of the Housing Opportunities Commission. This particular uh, development is um, a Paul Girard development and it's 60 units. And what's interesting about this is that it's the first project of its kind that, that we know of that is intentionally setting aside a number of apartments for chronically homeless individuals accompanied by on-site wraparound services by WestCap. And so with housing chronically homeless folks, wraparound services, supportive services are essential. Next slide. We were very, very um, excited uh, when on January 28th, 2021, the Housing Opportunities Commission was institutionalized 
and um, our city council members, Andrew Worthman on the left-hand side of the picture and Kate Beaton, um, now Kate Beaton Felton on the right-hand side have been our city council cha champions, many others that are supportive, but they have been and continue to be our champions. And again, we always say that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Next slide. Another one of our collaborative projects with these agencies and led by the city was our landlord support program. So in October of 2021, we collaborated with our community partners and the city agreed to a one-year pilot to increase relationship with landlords to take a chance on folks with high rental barriers and increased access. Um, the program was not a success that in spite of the, the risk mitigation funds that we provided for landlords, again, landlords were not incentivized enough to take that risk. Their experiences with folks with high rental barriers, that, that still was such a very strong barrier that that again, in spite of the incentives, that they were not they were not willing to take advantage of the program. And they said at the listening sessions that what they wanted was a landlord liaison. That's the primary thing that they wanted, because they are not social workers. They wanted someone who could respond to problems quickly when they made a call and intervene early. And the city did not have the funds to be able to fund that position. But listening to their perspective then sparked our wanting, our affordable housing task force to move forward on creating the Tenant Landlord Resource Center. Next slide. So I encourage you to go to our website and our Facebook page so our mission is to provide education, consultation, mediation services that really promote a effective working relationship between renters and housing providers. One eviction can change the complete trajectory of an individual or a family's life and multiple evictions destabilize entire communities. So we seek to intervene early to prevent evictions. What makes us different, again, as I mentioned earlier, is that our program coordinator meets one-to-one -one with folks that, con that, that contact us. And the overwhelming number of calls that we receive from tenants, they come in late, not, not early, that, that, that they contact us once they receive a notice to vacate or an eviction notice. And most situations involve the tenant not really understanding their lease. We also offer mediation services and I receive mediation training through UW-Madison and also the Winnebago Conflict Resolution Center. Next slide. So now you are going to meet uh, Elise and DeAndre and then Paul is going to um, finish up. Thanks so much, everybody. You know, having somewhere to call home and build a life, it, it brings you security and safety and, a, you know, peace of mind. And without having that, you know, it's really, really hard. You know, it's taking years off people's lives going through that stress and enduring that pain and suffering. I ended up having some a challenging past and being incarcerated. I had just so happened to apply for a apartment um, and then I had to pay a double deposit and have letters of recommendation to move into that place and a co-signer. I didn't have an extensive rental history. You know, when they said, list your last place you lived, you know, I was put in places where I stayed at. I didn't actually have a lease in my name. You know, when I'm putting a prison address, you know, they can pretty much put two and two together. 
They ask you, how much money do you have? You know, how much money do you make? They ask you these economic questions. It's detrimental to someone's like survival and their ability to thrive if they don't have adequate housing. <laughs> Someone in my position, when I finally get a lease in front of me, I'm, it'll, it'll be like that thing, do you acknowledge? You're just clicking yes, you're not even reading it. You're just going through it and saying yes, 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 yes. All right, here you go. Not realizing what you signed. And then when you finally get in the home, you do something that's, you know, breaching that contract and you're like, oh, I didn't know that. Having a lawyer, having that, you know, that agent going through each part of that lease with you. Nine times out of the 10, you're still going to sign it, but at least you still know what to expect, you know, and what to avoid. The Tenant Landlord Resource Center, I have connected with Susan Wolfgram. You know, I don't foresee us staying in this home forever as our family, our kids grow and our, you know, the kids grow, the house shrinks, right? So um, being able to eventually be homeowners or, or the likes and just kind of working through those things. And so that's how we learned about that. All right, we'll let mom go first. We're humans, we're people. You know, we everybody has a past. I always say, you know, each person is one bad decision away from a felony, you know, and being in the exact same shoes where you are able to stand and, and judge someone and deny them housing. Um, you know, housing insecurity can affect generations from stress and trauma. You know, I know coming from post-incarceration, getting into a home, I was like, I felt like I won the lottery. I was able to, you know, get my children back and build a family. And I can't say I, I it would be any kind of healthy or stable family or relationships if I was dealing with that housing insecurity. If you see that they have barriers, you know, ask them questions, get to know them as a person and then make your judgments. You can change lives and you can change generations by just allowing someone some somewhere to call home. We're going to want to go to the next slide. Thank you. Yep. One <laughs> sure. Those videos take a little longer. <laughs> Thanks for uh, the, your excellent uh, explanations and presentation, Susan. As you can tell, those of you who are listening, Susan has become uh, quite a powerful advocate for affordable housing in Eau Claire. Um, talking, we'll talk just briefly about some of the future directions that we're looking at. Susan mentioned the Day Resource Center. After a three-year process, it finally looks like a reality. They're looking for a building. Um, I happen to sit on the Western Dairyland Board of Directors, so I've been involved in, in uh, making those decisions as well. So as Susan said, having people at the right tables really uh, is, is uh, helpful. Um, we've done some uh, community uh, programs through the Eau Claire Tenant Landlord Resource Center, most recently on understanding your lease program. And the next one will be for landlords uh, to talk to them uh, hear from them about how we can uh, intervene to prevent evictions. Next slide, please. Um, another coalition building project coming up with uh, the city county developers. Uh, Susan pointed out um, we need housing for those uh, who earn 60% or less of the AMI, and we need to have a public conversation with key stakeholders to talk about how we can solve this problem. Uh, as I said before, it's a community problem that requires uh, community participation, all hands on deck. Susan mentioned that WIDA projects are not uh, sufficient to provide uh, funding for uh, low-income housing. Uh, finally, um, 
our state and federal government needs to provide more funding. And we hear this from our, our uh, city government all the time, that they don't have the funds. And so we need to lobby our state and our federal government to provide more funding. Um, Susan likes to say we need to talk, we need to move from uh, why we can't to how we can. We hear that why we can't way too often, um, but we need to talk about how we can. Next slide, please. Susan mentioned uh, that we are um, we have are on social media. If you want to uh, keep track of what we're involved in, you can like us on Facebook at both um, the Journal Affordable Housing Task Force page and the Eau Claire Tenant Landlord Resource Center page. If you're interested, I would encourage you to look over the Eau Claire Tenant Landlord Resource uh, page. It's it's a, just a huge uh, collection of information that would be a benefit to tenants and landlords. We spent a lot of time uh, and with assistance from the Madison Tenant uh, Resource Center, compiling a lot of useful information that tenants can use. So uh, I suggest that you take a minute to look it over. Next slide, please. Susan likes to say that our our uh, superpower is our imagination, and I like that. Um, we do look forward to imagining together with you and people in our communities, in our state, in our nation. We want to imagine a world where everyone has a safe, decent, affordable home in which to live with dignity. Next page, next slide, please. Uh, if you'd like to have, if you have any questions about things that we've talked about today, you'd like more information uh, about our work, or if you'd like to ask about uh, some kind of leadership training, please contact us through our email. Um, you've got those there. Uh, one more slide and we're, we're out. Um, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to entertain them right now. Um, put them in the chat. Uh, if you're on live, you can just uh, speak up. Yeah. So I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> of um, course you do. <laughs> always. Um, one of the questions I had for you guys, because I mean, just listening to all that is happening in Eau Claire, it's so much. What would you say of all the projects you listed had the biggest impact? If you had to only do one thing, what would it be? Wow. <laughs> For me, um, it's less a project and it's more getting housing advocates sitting at as many tables as possible to influence the projects that are coming forward. That would be, if, if I was going to recommend one thing, that is what I would recommend. And do not expect that you're going to be embraced and welcomed. In fact, you very often, there will be pushback for you to not be there. I can't tell you how many times I have gotten criticized on the plan commission for being an advocate for affordable housing. But yet I know what my role is. I know that I'm not violating any plan commission rules through the city and I continue to do so. And so Paul, do you want to mention the phrase that you often say? Uh, you'll have to I'm remind me. I'm going to clue you in no permanent. No, yeah. <laughs> in organizing, we have a, an expression, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. That's a tough one for a lot of folks. It is a tough one. But that what that means is that our work and the people that we work with and for are at the center of our work. Always. And, uh, so sometimes people are aligned with our our plans and sometimes they're not and uh it's it's not personal it's just the work i i'd also say that i think that since we've been active since 2018 i i've seen a, a real shift in the culture in our community that affordable housing is uh a high priority a top priority really 
in our city government. And the kinds of projects that we started working on that were at first looked at with some suspicion maybe are now I think more embraced, uh, mm -hmm. are, are understood. Um, the community or the day resource center is an example uh, for a long time, a lot of folks who worked in the uh, industry working with homeless people were a bit suspicious of our work, but as we continue to demonstrate that we get things done, um, those things are embraced and accepted. And I think that that's a culture change. I mentioned at the very beginning, you need the whole community involved. They need to understand the importance of the projects. And I just want to add just one thing to that. Um, I don't think it's wise to just wait for people's better angels to show up <laughs> on their shoulders. That I think it's really important to make the economic argument for those mm -hmm. folks where the better angels have not arrived yet. Okay, make the make the economic argument. And so for the Day Resource Center, that was one that we made: is that how much money will taxpayers save? When we have a day resource center, we're not going to have as many folks going to the emergency rooms, not as many police or EMS calls, on and on and on. So I do think that's an important point to make because there are a lot of people, and we hear from these people on the daily, that you know that really would hope that you just got all of our folks experiencing homelessness on you know three city buses and just get them out of town. Lots of people feel that way. So I'll, I'll just stop there. <laughs> Any other questions? So I have one final one. Um, I just wanted to leave it if there was anything else popping up, but doesn't look like it. So this is a lot. And I feel like we touched on this before um, we went live a little bit, but like, this is a lot and it can get really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. This work is, there's so much, like listening mm -hmm. to your presentation, this is the second time I've heard it and it makes me tired because <laughs> you guys are busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You're doing so much. So how do you stay hopeful when the world just seems so overwhelming and the, pro the problems seem so big? How do you stay hopeful? Paul, do you want to start with that and then I can add to it? Sure. Well, um, I think I'm just naturally an optimistic person, so it's not hard for me to do that. But I'll tell you, working with the people that we work with in our task force and in our community who are uh, pitching in right alongside us, that gives me hope. Um, it's not It's not just us. We're we're oh, that's for so sure. many of us doing this work to, uh, together, and uh, so that that gives me hope. Yeah, and in addition to that, for me, um, so I was saying earlier before this started that I tell myself over time that I'm not in charge of the outcome, but I'm in charge of my own process, what I do, and and another thing is that. Take Elise and DeAndre as an example. That that's one family, one family, but yet it's generational change for their four children. Yeah. And so when you think about it that way, that yes, you know, the policy realm, all of that is important, but we're still going one by one. And every one can be a generational change. So that's what I keep reminding myself as well. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Steve, um, for joining us today and having this conversation. Um, I hope that it is a little bit of fuel as we continue to plant seeds all around the state um, to be talking about affordable housing and talking about our communities. So thank you. Thank you, Brianna and Steve, very, very much. Yeah, Bye, thanks everyone. for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.